Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Terry D Davis as our next speaker. Dr. Davis is Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at Louisiana <coughs> State University, and she's a pioneer in the field of health literacy. For the past 25 years, she has investigated and written about the impact of patient literacy on health and health care. We're very pleased to welcome you today. Well, thanks. So I was asked to speak, is numeracy more difficult with poor health? So I'm going to tell you the evidence, my experience, and I'm most excited to tell you some possibilities I've been dreaming of. So does poor health affect numeracy? Probably. But a medical librarian and I found no studies in the literature. However, we found tons of studies indicating poor health, chronic disease, impact cognition. But we're focused on numeracy right now. So here's my experience. Health literacy expert has a taste of her own medicine. So here's the context. I should have proficient health literacy skills. I've been on the faculty of a medical school for over 30 years. Um, I've been conducting, I, you know, I've been there longer than the uh, medical students have been alive. Um, I've conducted research in health literacy longer than the medical students have been alive. I've done tons of teaching, so I should know this stuff. But um, using Ruth's schematic, before I was a patient, I had never missed work. I was 60 years old when, I, when this story, I'm 66 now, 60 years old. I had never missed work one day because I was sick. So I didn't use health insurance. I didn't go to the doctor. I was never sick. And the faulty belief was, since I wasn't sick, that I had to be healthy. Uh, so uh, I took no prescription or over-the-counter medicines. And I pay no attention to health insurance or leave requirements or any of that other bureaucracy because I didn't need to. But then this was what got me, the demands and complexity of the healthcare system and insurance. So when I went to the cardiologist, I have this uh, to-do pad. This is what I have to do on the airplane going home for our land. And um, I was waiting there on the exam room table when he came in and told me I needed open heart surgery, I handed him this tablet and I said, can you write down what you think's wrong with me and what we need to do? And he wrote down moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. AFib with slow response. I think you need AFib ablation with possible mitral valve repair. Now he needed my plain language lecture, but the point was I could go home, I could Google this, I could call all kinds of MD friends in Treeport and around the country who begin to mobilize and help me. In hindsight, I should have asked the insurance company and the LSU bureaucracy, what do you think I need to do? Because I had no idea. So I went to a Mecca, found out on Google. They did more of these procedures than anybody in the country. Had no mortality last year. That sounded pretty good to me. And so I met, everything was so well organized before surgery, the surgeon spent an hour with me and my family. My children had a lot of questions, but I had no idea the cost of anything. I just knew I was out of network, and so it's going to be 30% copay. However, discharge seemed like a checkoff. The nurse went flying through all the medicines that I had to take. I'd been taking, they had finally put me on warfarin, uh, but she put me on a bunch more medicines. And I was lost and overwhelmed. I remember looking at my husband thinking, I hope you're getting this because I'm completely off. I'm completely lost. Um, and she's, I asked her to write down the indication for each of the medicines. And she was so irritated because it slowed her down and she didn't want to do that. So I was a medication virgin, as I told you. So let me tell you this. Even though I've been on the faculty for now 33 years, these names are crazy. They're, it's not intuitive how to pronounce the brand names or the generic names, and you don't want to sound stupid in the doctor's office when they ask you what's your own. I felt unsure of the instructions. The nurse wasn't aware she was going so fast. She did that all the time. And my husband went to the drugstore. We, we went to a hotel. I was away from home. He went to the drugstore, bought all the drugs, but the pharmacist didn't give him any instructions uh, orally, and he didn't ask any questions. So that night in the hotel, I had this Coumadin conundrum. 
So the warfarin bottle said, take at night, but I had been given all of my meds at discharge at noon. So I didn't know if I was to take the warfarin or not. And I felt vulnerable. I felt fragile. I called back up to the Mecca. They put me through to the discharge nurse. She said, let me go to the handy dandy computer. And then she said, oh, you're not in the computer anymore. And I said, well, you've got you to help me make this decision. And do I take the warfarin tonight or have you already given it to me? And the only thing she could say, which she said over and over again, I can't tell you anything except we usually give this at night. So that was me feeling vulnerable and sort of overwhelmed. So uh, also Coumadin, and you know, you, your Coumadin level varies, your, uh, your INR varies, and so the instructions vary all the time. And then some of the labels said take at night, some of them didn't take this. This is one of my personal favorites. Uh, take one pad, 10 milligrams by mouth, once daily except Tuesday and Thursday, one and a half pads, 15 milligrams, once daily on Tuesday and Thursday. And so, I mean, can we say this in a more convoluted way? Here's the medication list. And as Rima says, let's deconstruct this. So, aldaptone, found out that was a diuretic. Take one tablet daily for one month. Pretty straightforward. Prilosec, found out that was for your stomach, but I have this iron stomach. Why did I need Prilosec? Take one tablet daily for two weeks. Lisinopril, found out that was for high blood pressure. She didn't write down these things. Take one tablet daily. Do I take it for 30 days or the rest of my life? I don't have high blood pressure. Lasix, I didn't know that was a diuretic. Take one tablet daily for one week and then daily as needed for a week. How did I know I needed it? Nobody taught me to look at my ankles or any other indicator to tell. So then you, you get discharged with pain medicines. So they discharge me on Percocet. One tablet as needed for severe pain, not to exceed 12 and 24 hours. Then Tylenol, take two tablets every four to six hours as needed for pain. So do I take these together or do I kind of mix them up? And then you start getting into some math here. And it, it wasn't until Mike and Ruth and I started doing research on acetaminophen that I noticed this, never paid any attention to these numbers, found out that was five of oxycodone, 325 of acetaminophen. Then I was taking acetaminophen here. They had prescribed 325. But when I got home, people said, oh, why don't you take Tylenol PM or Tylenol arthritis? That has 500 milligrams. I never paid attention to any of the milligrams. Acetaminophen overdose, main cause of liver failure in the United States, main cause of suicide in Europe. But I hadn't paid any attention to any of that. So then you need health literacy skills to take Tylenol. Um, there are 80 square feet of pain medicine at Walmart. I found out that Americans are into pain medicine. Um, so uh, also, Ruth said, the active ingredient is the most important thing on the over-the-counter. I said, Ruth, that sounds like yeast. You know, it, active ingredient, that didn't mean a whole lot to me. I didn't know to look for that. Told, I told her it wasn't on my bottle, and there and there it was, Binger and Dallas and Yella. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, so then Mike and Ruth and I are playing around with, can we make this easier for people? And so we're, you know, think about if anybody has a headache right now, what are you taking? How many are you taking? What do you, what do you base that on? How bad the headache is, what you did last time, what your mother told you? Um, and so, you know, here we're trying, who knows if this icon's going to make any difference, but we do know that color and icons the eye will go to that and try to navigate where to look on the bottle for what you need to look for. So if you ha I, medical students are so young and they're not, maybe they take birth control pills, but they're not taking much else. And so this is what I had when I got home and I didn't have a plan for how, how to take these and I couldn't tell the difference. And look at this, I was taking Lipitor and Warfarin. Okay, if you take two Lipitor, you don't take your Lipitor, it's not, the in, it's not the end of the world. But, you know, two Warfarin versus no Warfarin, it could be. Also, a friend of mine gave me one of these to try to get organized, but then Friday flipped off. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, they're not the highest quality item. And so, um, you know, like if you travel and you're gone on Friday, then you have to kind of jake-leg it and 
put the other ones. And so then that got to be a little confusing also. Um, I began to wonder what else was wrong with me. I had osteoporosis. How could that be? Run forever. Um, so here's the osteoporosis deal. Calcium twice daily, Phizomax, which I hated taking, once a week. So how do I work this into my life? It's me in the kitchen. I'm the kind of person that stumbles into the kitchen and I have to have coffee immediately. I'm from Louisiana. I drink a lot of coffee. And I didn't like not being able to drink coffee as soon as I got up. But here are the instructions. Take with eight ounces of water at least 30 minutes before first food or beverage drug of the day. Don't lie down for 30 minutes. So I, I came up with my own plan. Drink some water. Have coffee after 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll wait to drink orange juice and eat breakfast. I won't lie down for morning yoga stretches. And I never take it when I was traveling, so the day of the week would change depending on where I was. Then I want to point out, I have this crazy cousin, Nancy, but so does everybody in this room. So she's very bright. She's retired. She lives on the computer. She's concerned about me and all my prescription medicines. She's in alternative medicine. She sends me at least a couple of emails every week about supplements, alternative cures for AFib, mitral valve problems, high cholesterol, problems with Fosamax. She wants me to look at acid in my urine. She wants me to take soda and water every day, stop working so damn much, and meditate more. <laughs> but you don't know what the cousin Nancy's are telling your patients. System redesign, Darren, doesn't have to be complex. This was a, a page from my husband's daycare surgery. The RNs responded to the Joint Commission, and uh, they did a teach back before surgery, and they developed a four-question IQ test before they discharged him. So if your prescriptions read, Bernard, how do you pronounce this? Ciprofloxin. One tablet twice daily, you would take two in the morning, two at bedtime, whatever. They were just trying to do the math and make sure he knew how to take his medicine. So Mike and Ruth and I are also looking at with the community clinic patients who have diabetes or hypertension, a new label that has everything the patient needs to know here. This is for Mike. It's his globuride. It's for his diabetes. Two pills at breakfast, carriage return, two pills at dinner. We have the schematic. Here's what I want to show you. Patients were either given the standard label or this improved label without any counseling. And at baseline, 60% understood the standard, but 74% understood the more patient-centered label. And at three months, the adherence was strikingly, significantly better. And this is without any counseling. So, you know, life goes on, and here's my new medicines. Uh, and they changed. I'm on the generic Lipitor now. And look, it looks like my vitamin D. And I can't tell the difference in my calcium and my vitamin C now. They look the same. But I want to tell you, I'm highly literate. But you, I, Ruth said, you just dump those pills out and take them. I dump them out, and I look at them. And I know what I'm taking based on their color and their shape. And when they change color and shape, it throws me more than you would think. So then, here's some other thoughts. I like to drink beer with dinner. Does that affect my numeracy when I'm taking uh, medicine at night? <laughs> That's my friend Susan. She's an OB-GYN. She had to retire last year because she has Parkinson's. She likes champagne. She's taken a bunch of medicines. Does this impact our it impacts cognition? I don't know how much it impacts our ability to take our nighttime meds. What about being distracted, sleep deprived, Michael Wolf, feeling stressed, being away from home? There I am at the Hyatt last night. So here's some lessons learned about taking meds. Hospital discharge is only a tip of the iceberg. Following discharge recommendation is a process, understanding the treatment plans, the benefits, problem solving, how to embed the medicines in everyday life with beer, with travel, plan ahead not to run out, know the drill at the pharmacy, you gotta get a lot of confidence, negotiate with insurance companies and accept their ethos. It is what it is. High literacy and assertiveness and connections don't guarantee adequate health literacy. So. My, cup, my final slides are about insurance. It's a nightmare. It was for me. What policy do I choose? What does it cover? How do I read the bill? How do I read the not a bill? Uh, how do I talk to the company? 
Then if you, if you have a turn 65, when you turn 64, you get daily calls and inundated with mail, uh, insurance company who want to sell you Medicare. And as my husband said, they just want to sell us something, Terry. And so there was a little mistrust of all of this help that was coming in. It was kind of like a used car deal. I heard the CEO of Mount Sinai a couple of weeks ago, he said they file claims on 350 insurance policies. They're not that many agencies, companies, but they're all different kind of policy. He said that's part of what's jacking up their cost. So here's my not a bill. <laughs> and here's what I want to point out. And I spent a lot of time talking to the insurance company about this, these not a bills. This is the, the number of the service. And I said, but I can't tell by the number what the service is. And so the insurance agency said, well, we can't tell you what the service was. <laughs> so I, I, we're now on Blue Cross. The state employees are, that's a little cleaner than what the state group health plan was. Um, then there was a cool article in the New York Times last week. Uh, Gina Colada was trying to help her daughter who's uninsured figure out what the cost of the vaginal delivery was. So she called Dr. Um, Uwe Reinhardt, who's a health economist at UPenn, and, um, to ask for help. And he said, these are direct quotes, hospitals don't have to tell you their prices, and they often keep it a secret until they send the bill. Private insurers claim they let patients know what out-of-pocket Costs likely to be. However, a check of United Healthcare's website found nothing for vaginal delivery or appendectomy. Calling the hotline, the help desk couldn't find any information. And he said, It's also pathetic. How can people make good choices about healthcare if they can't find out about cost or quality? Um, of course, as you said, quality is harder to quantify than cost, but cost does have a number. So if I were the queen, I would provide clear and accessible information on cost and quality, inform friendly navigators available by phone to personally assist with medicine and insurance questions, no computer trees, long holes, or suggestions to call another department, which I encountered over and over and over again. It took me 13 months to settle the insurance for my open heart surgery. Patient-centered hospital discharge instructions, universal, easy-to-read, navigate instructions on all prescription and over-the-counter bottles, and an Apple Store approach to buying and using insurance. Also, since I, this was my queen slide, I just decided to throw in no passwords required for <laughs> medical journals to review or submit articles. <laughs> so this is my final slide. What is what is our action plan in this room? This body has a chance to do something. I think we should address that red. So prescription and over-the-counter labels and medicine guides standardize these. Make them easier to see, navigate, understand, and act on. As Nike said, just do it. And I want to tell you about this Apple Store approach. I, I am a technology goofus, but I go into an Apple Store. The cost is apparent. They clarify smart use. They objectively and patiently offer help when customers buy it, are confused or overwhelmed trying to use it, and they make the experience pleasant. Finally, remember technology is a tool, doesn't replace a nice, knowledgeable person helping you. As many in this room know, health is personal. Thanks.